I will invite you to turn in the Scriptures to, to Mark chapter 6. That's the portion that I'll be preaching from. We're continuing in our series, sermon series in Mark's Gospel that we've been doing in the morning. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the remarkable majesty of Jesus in handling desperate situations, situations that, that before which people were helpless. He instantly calmed a storm with a mere word, that a storm that had put his seafaring friends in terror that they could do nothing about, and he calmed it with a word. He drove out a legion of demons that had terrorized a whole community. He healed a woman that had had a flow of blood for 12 years, who only got worse as the physicians had treated her over those years. And he raised a 12-year-old girl from the dead so that she was immediately made well. He was just like waking a child up from sleep. You know, little girl, get up. And up she rose. In each instance, those who saw were left in utter amazement. They marveled at what they saw. They were struck by the majesty of the one who stood before them and who did these mighty works with such ease as one that was in complete authority. But with Mark 6, we come to a passage where his majesty is not acknowledged. And this time, he is the one who is amazed. I've entitled the sermon, Unbelief That Even Made Jesus Marvel. So listen as I read this passage to you, beginning in Mark 6, verse 1. This is the Word of God, so please give careful attention to it. Mark 6, 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his holy word. Consider here our Savior's gracious desire to do good. We're told in verse 1 that he came to his own country with his disciples. We're not told what that country was, but we know that he grew up in Nazareth. And uh, it's a, it was a small village that was about 25 miles to the southwest of Capernaum. It was never, it was never mentioned in the Old Testament at all. It was not mentioned in the rabbinic literature of the, uh, the Mishnah or the Talmud. And it was not mentioned by the Jewish historian Josephus or hardly anyone else. One obscure reference to the place has been found. But archaeologists, we, we know of course where, where it is. Archaeologists have concluded as they've done their diggings there that it was an obscure hamlet with earthen dwellings in it, about 60 acres in a rocky hillside, with a total population they have determined of not more than 500. So this is a very small place. Some of you are familiar with the nostalgia of returning home when, to a place where you grew up especially when you've only been away for a year or two. This is all the stronger when the place that you come from is a small place where everybody knows everybody and where many of your relatives live. Jesus likely knew everyone in this place. 
He had lived there for almost 30 years, growing up there, working as a carpenter, someone that works with um, hard materials is what that means, wood, stone, we don't know exactly, but he had probably worked for many of them, and he was acquainted with all the different quirks of the people and all their different habits, and he, he knew them. His mother and brothers were there, and his sisters, they we're told in verse 3 that they still live there too, and probably they were married now. We must remember that he was more human than any of us are, because he had no sin, and so his humanity wasn't clouded out by, snuffed out with the death of sin that, that ours is. So he experienced the fullness of the feelings and that that you have as you go to your people, and you're among them. You're, you're, you're with those that you have known for a long time. Think of the great love that he had for these people. Because remember, he loved his neighbor as himself. None of us really do that. How he cared about each one of the members of this community. How he must have prayed for them over the years as he was living in that community day after day, exchanging things with them, doing business. He dearly loved these people. and There's no malice in him toward his neighbors. Look at how he endeavors to do them good. In verse 2, we're told that when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. His great desire in teaching, no doubt, was to persuade them that the kingdom of God was at hand. That they should repent and believe the good news. That was his message in every place, as Mark has told us. Surely to them, his people, he brought this message. How earnestly he must have prayed before he delivered this message. And as he delivered this message. And as he anticipated speaking the word to them. As a man, he did not know unless it was specifically revealed to him how his message would be received. Sometimes he had prophetic revelation, but the divine nature and the human nature are not mixed together in such a way that he knows everything that God knows. Doesn't know when he's coming back, for example, he told us. As a son of God, he knows all things and upholds the universe. But in his human flesh, he knows only what is revealed to him. As a sinless man, he certainly yearned for his gospel to be welcomed and embraced to the salvation of these people. That he taught on this occasion is all the more a loving act in that he had previously been rejected when he went to Nazareth on an earlier visit. That visit we're told of in, in Luke, where he visited Nazareth before he set out on his Galilean ministry at which time he settled in Capernaum, where we have seen him. On that occasion, he had come from Judea, where he had been ministering there earlier, and he was um, without the twelve, because he had not yet called them when he went the first time. He had been rudely received at that time, as they sought to drive him off a cliff, where, when he claimed to be the servant that Isaiah spoke of, and told them that many in Israel would reject God's messenger and that many of the Gentiles would come and believe. It appears that they would have killed him if they could. They wanted to push him off a high cliff. But now, a year or so later, he's come back. And in his love, he goes back to preach to them again at the synagogue. He will not be hindered by their previous abuse. His love will not allow it. Perhaps they will listen to him now that he has been acknowledged elsewhere as a prophet and where news has reached them of the marvelous signs that he has done. Maybe they had even heard of the recent raising of Jairus' daughter, a ruler in the synagogue. Maybe they had heard of that. Surely he was also ready to heal and deliver those at Nazareth who were in need. His heart of compassion always stirred when he saw those who were sick and in need. You remember when he healed the man with the withered hand and the woman who was bent over and the Pharisees said, oh, it's the wrong day. And 
he, he said that he had compassion on, on these ones, seeing their need to set them free from their affliction. Know that our Lord Jesus still delights to do good to others. He has sent us to do good in His name. He's reigning at the right hand of the Father. He still has human flesh. He still also, of course, always will be in His divine nature. But He also is still in human flesh there reigning for us. When you go to serve, when you go to encourage someone, when preachers go to preach, when you go to help those in need, when you seek to be an example and you pray for opportunities to, to minister to others, to tell others of your hope, Jesus is with you, delighting in what you're doing. He loves for His gospel to go forth as much as He ever did. Just as much as He loved it when He was here and went everywhere preaching. We see at the end of this passage, He went around to all the villages preaching the Word of God. He intercedes for us continually in heaven. He ever lives, Hebrews says, to make intercession for us. Know that He is doing so even when you so much as give a cup of cold water in His name. He prays for our church, for our worship services, for each one of us to be blessed as we come together as God's people. It makes it very special, very precious. Something that we should should realize the, 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 the gravity and the opportunity that we have. He's out for our blessing. He's out for our good. He, but He can't be our Savior. We know who He is. That's what the people of Nazareth concluded. Look at verse 2 and 3. And when the Sabbath had come, He began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. It would seem that they were offended because they knew him. As Jesus says in verse 4, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. They said, how can he be anything special? We know who he is. He's just one of us. He's nobody special. He's the carpenter. Not a messenger from God that we should listen to. They said this even though they could see both his wisdom and and His divine authority. What wonderful things they saw. Think about this. They were astonished, it says, at the wisdom by which He spoke. They heard words that that rang with, with truth and authority that resonated in them as true as truth does. They heard words that were full of grace and hope. His words are words that penetrated them and show them like the woman at Samaria, all that they had ever done. They were also astonished at the mighty works that were done by His hand. Not only had they heard reports about His miracles, but we we're told that He also did a few while He was among them, as verse 5 indicates. The evidence was all there that He was from God. It was right before their face. They could not deny it. How could they deny it? They inquired where he got these things. They knew his background. They knew where he came from. They knew that he had not studied under any famous rabbi. He had not sat at anyone's feet. He had not even been to university. He was a carpenter. But there he was, speaking with wisdom and performing mighty signs and wonders. The answer was obvious. His teaching and authority had to be of divine origin. They even referred to it as wisdom that's given to him. But they refused to accept that. They concluded that he could not be anyone special because he's just one of us. They knew who he was. He did not meet their criteria. 
to be the Messiah. He did not meet their criteria for what they thought the Messiah ought to be. This problem is actually much bigger than Nazareth. The Jewish nation as a whole rejected him for pretty much the same reason. He can't be the Messiah. He's one who died on the cross. He can't be the Messiah. None of the chief priests and scribes know who he is. It's kind of the opposite. These guys knew who he was. So we know where he came from. They, they had no interest. And they said the scribes and the chief priests, they, they don't know where he came from. So he can't be. He must conform to their concept of what the Messiah ought to be. He must save them from Roman dominion at once, not go to the cross. It's the last thing that any of them thought the Messiah should do, including his own disciples. They had to work through that. Many of the Greeks could not accept him as both God and man after he began to be preached in the world. God the Son now taking on the nature of man while still remaining God. To them, that was absurd and scandalous. He can't be the Savior of the world that He was preached to be. We know, they said, that God cannot take to Himself human flesh. It's not anything God would ever do. It's not anything possible. He does not measure up. This one does not measure up to our requirements. And so today, there is a common error, related error. Many will have Him as mere man, but refuse to acknowledge that He is God, who has come in flesh. Often they take him as their poster boy for their cause, whatever it may be. He's the ideal of whatever they want him to be, rather than the Son of God. That's idolatry. They make him to be what they want, rather than being the Son of God who comes with authority to call us to repent and believe the gospel that, and tell us that there is in the gospel the forgiveness of sins through him and a kingdom of righteousness that only He establishes and that no one can enter but through Him. They refuse to accept that He can call out sinners who need to be saved by Him. No, to be the right kind of Savior, He must conform to what they want Him to be. He's got to conform to their causes and their ideas. But perhaps the saddest of all are those who grow up in the church and will not have Him. They have heard His glory declared, and they know all about Him. They're familiar with what the Bible says about Him, and they know that He's not what I need. He cannot be a Savior for me. So all these conclude, He can't be our Savior. We know who He is. What folly for us to suppose that we know what God must do to save us. We're the ones that are in the miserable condition in which we need to be saved. We're the ones who have rebelled against God. We don't know what needs to be done. It's, it's not that He can't be our, our Savior because, or, or we, we conclude that He can't be our Savior because we know who He is, but actually He can't be our Savior because of our unbelief. We're told that it was unbelief of the people of Nazareth that kept Him from doing many miracles among them. Verse 5 says, Now He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. It was not that he was unable. He had authority to heal the sick and to cast out demons. His power was the same regardless of what anyone thought of him. But the pride of these people kept them from coming to him because they refused to acknowledge his authority. To come for healing or expulsion of demons would require them to humble themselves before him and acknowledge his authority. They were so careful to protect their pride that they deprived themselves of the benefits of His healing ministry. Isn't that insane? Here's one that could heal them, but I can't acknowledge His authority, so I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna avoid Him. You have the real basis there for your unbelief. The evidence is all there. The truth itself attests to you, and yet you hang on your pride and refuse to believe. How destructive unbelief is. It's one of the most destructive things of all. By unbelief, sinners deprive themselves of the forgiveness of sin. They find some fault with God's remedy, some defect in their mind with, a, with the Savior, and they refuse to go to Him. They say He's got something wrong with Him. He's got something that doesn't measure up right. So they go on in their guilt without remedy. Oh, they try to 
salve themselves a little bit. They, they deny their guilt. But that will not help them on the day of judgment. A murderer can convince himself that there was nothing wrong in murdering someone, but it won't help him when he stands before the court. If you do not come to Christ for forgiveness, you will have to bear the full punishment of God for all your sin. There will be no escape for you if you reject God's remedy. The outcome will be eternal torment in the lake of fire. What blessings you will forfeit. You will forfeit the blessings of this life. The comfort of having all your sins forgiven. The joy of of serving the Lord, even the privilege of persecution for Him in this life and fellowship with Him, the fellowship of the saints and communion with God, growth in holiness and new life and in the knowledge of Christ, all of those benefits. You forfeit living in hope of Christ's return, living in the assurance of His love. You forfeit all of this because of your proud unbelief, because you found some defect in Christ. You also forfeit the blessings of the life to come. The resurrection of your body to immortality. A new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. The delight of living in God's house where His glory is seen and where His kindness is constantly experienced. The glorious company of all the people of God made perfect in love and righteousness so that they all love as He loved us. What folly to let unbelief keep you from the one and only Savior. Such unbelief caused even Jesus to marvel. Verse 6 says, And he marveled because of their unbelief. It's very striking. Jesus marveled. We have seen Jesus doing signs and wonders that made the people around him marvel. But he always seems to be unimpressed with him, with with what he's done. You remember last week with the raising of Jairus' daughter, the the girl's parents and the three disciples who saw it there um, when she was raised, the girl's parents and the three disciples who saw it were, were overcome, it says, with great amazement. And Jesus just said, little girl, get up, just normal language, quotes the words he used, just an ordinary way that you tell a child to get up when it was time to get up in the morning. And she got up from her death and walked around and they're all amazed and astonished. And Jesus says, hey, she's hungry. (laughs) You need to get her something to eat. The majesty, the poise. What a a marvelous, marvelous picture. He he wasn't amazed at uh, what everyone else was amazed by. In fact, there's only one other time that this particular word marvel that's used here is used of Jesus. And that's with the, also has to do with faith. But the presence of faith that was in the Roman centurion. Maybe you remember this man that the Jews came to Jesus and said, hey, this centurion, you know, he built a synagogue for us. He, he was a rich and powerful man, of course. He was there because there was a lot of wealth in the, in the area and they had a, the, the, um, the taxation with the customs house there and everything where Matthew had worked and so uh, he sent Jesus to request the healing of his servant. And do you remember what that centurion did when he heard that Jesus was coming? He was a little bit, I think, surprised that Jesus was coming because he was a Gentile. And uh, in Luke 7, verse 6 through 9, it says, The centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. He sent the, the Jews, you see. But, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. It appears that Jesus, again, in his human nature, not knowing all things future, did not expect this. He marveled. He was delighted at what he saw. He, had, he, was, he was amazed when he saw faith like this in a Gentile. 
And it gave him great pleasure because it was the Father's gift to him, a harbinger anticipating the coming of all the Gentiles. And he knew that that prophecy was given that many would come from the nations. And he was rejoicing in the Father's bestowment of this precious gift. So Jesus marveled. And the only other time that word is used is also has to do with faith. But this time, with what is the opposite of that, Israel, the people who knew him, their lack of faith marvels at unbelief. He marvels at such stubbornness that these who know him, these people that he knows should be, that they should be so hardened so as to reject him. They knew him. They knew his integrity. They knew his sanity. These were the people in his own community for 30 years. They knew his character. He had never cheated anyone. He'd never told any a lie. They knew his love and his kindness who loved them in their village. Imagine what it'd be like to have one that, that was without sin, loving you in the community all those years. What a delight he must have been. They recognize now as he speaks, even his wisdom from above. And they see his mighty deeds. And yet they refuse. That's extraordinary. How could it be? It made him marvel. You ought to marvel at unbelief too, whenever you see it. Sometimes we don't stop to consider how absurd unbelief really is. We all know that God made us. It's a fact that we cannot deny. He, we can see His eternal power and divine nature in the things that He made. We suppress this truth with outlandish theories and speculations that are preposterous even for a little child to believe. And we all know that we have sinned against God. We're, we're moral beings, whether we try to deny it, but we're moral beings. We're inescapably moral. And then if by God's grace the gospel should come our way, it's a marvel that we should hear that God sent His Son into the world to die for sinners, to be punished in the place of guilty sinners, and that we should see that His followers testify that God raised Him from the dead, accepting His sacrifice, and that they preached the message for which they all died is they were, uh, or at least nearly all of them, we don't know for sure about everyone, but uh, forfeiting all sorts of advantages that they might have had if they had, had preached something different. And where the message is one that is a humbling message, where they confess not that we're great and worthy of God, but that we're the opposite, we're unworthy of God, and we have to depend upon Him. And they, they preached this and they died for it. Here is God's way of salvation clearly revealed in the world. And yet it is not believed. And that word bears witness to those who hear it that it is true. You have to push it away and suppress it and avoid it and try to ignore it. It's insane that every human being does not rush to Christ as soon as the word of the gospel comes to him. It's something to marvel at. It's something that Jesus marveled at. So go ahead and marvel Sometimes I think we're too hesitant to marvel about this. Perhaps we're thinking that others must see something that we are missing somehow. But it's not true. It's as plain as it can be. And it's insanity to deny it. So go ahead and marvel at unbelief. Don't let yourself be duped into thinking it's not insane to refuse what God has brought into the world. But of course, you must be careful about how you marvel. You must not marvel in a smug or proud way. Not at all that. Because you know what we have seen about this stubborn unbelief? It is in every one of us. And there is not one of us that would come to God unless He initiates and changes our hearts. God's Word teaches that faith is the gift of God. Because we're so incurably stubborn. It's not because it doesn't make sense. It's because our hearts are so hard and cold that not one of us would ever come to God. God's Word teaches that faith is a gift of God and not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
There are no grounds for boasting that you have faith and someone else doesn't. And it is He who made you alive. You did not change your heart. You did not put a new spirit within you. That was His work. You did not cause yourself to be born again. You were dead. He's the one that caused you to be born. The only reason you believe is because like Lydia, God opened your heart. Because He chose you freely as one that He would redeem. Because He appointed you before the foundation of the world for belief in the truth. If He had not called you with that divine call that brings about in you the life that it calls for, you would still be in your unbelief. Whether you're a child of the covenant like Jacob and Esau or an outsider to God's people from the world, if you're in Christ today, it's because He caused the light of the glorious gospel of Christ to shine in your heart. That's why you believe today if you believe. If you do not believe, it's because you've got a stubborn, hard, rebellious heart that refuses to look at what is plainly and clearly true. It's only because He has changed you that you can now see how insane unbelief is. Now that you believe, go ahead and marvel because it is insane. But really, you should marvel even more about the unbelief that still remains in you. You who have received the truth as God's gift. Belief in the truth. Perhaps it's even more amazing that God has opened your heart to believe and there's still so much unbelief in you. Remember the man that said, I believe, help my unbelief? How often do you insanely live as if the treasures of heaven are worth very little and the treasures of earth are worth everything? So much that you don't even bother to read the word. You've got something more important to do that you don't bother to go to the services of church. If you do, you do so with very little hunger, with very little prayer. You've got an appetite for other things. It's unbelief. You come as if the treasure is worth little. You're more eager to see a post on Facebook than you are to read God's Word. You've got time for that, but you don't have time to come before the Lord. We could go on about our unbelief, as believers. But when we see the unbelievers of this world, yes, we should marvel that they refuse what is so obvious, but not without a great deal of humility that the only reason we believe is because God gave us the gift of faith and marveling that we who have been called into God's fellowship continue in so much unbelief still. And you must also marvel at unbelief without glee but with deep sorrow. You know how sometimes when you see something that is insane, there's almost a kind of a glee, kind of a gloating. And there is a form of laughter that's appropriate for things that are ridiculous at the insanity of unbelief. How, how, how can this be? But there should be much sorrow because these are your neighbors. And they're going to perish unless they come to Christ. You should weep for them. You should plead with God for them. And you should also plead with them whenever you're given opportunity. Let's return to look at the marveling of our Lord in this regard. He was, to be sure, marveling. There there was, to be sure, a marveling that filled him with sorrow. With a centurion... It was amazed gladness that he had. He marveled at the faith he saw in that man. Filled him with hope and gladness about the Father's promise that at the time appointed the Gentiles would pour into the church. The nations would flow up to Jerusalem, so to speak. Jesus prays for this from heaven now. And he delights in it as he sees it fulfilled. It gives him joy and pleasure. But with his own people, he marveled at what he was losing. He was a man of sorrows. He went to Nazareth to the people that he knew so well with earnest prayer as he arrived and went before them to preach in the synagogue. Perhaps now, this time, they would hear him. How could they not believe? Now, 
how He loved these people. But to His amazement, they heard His wisdom and they saw His authority and instead of believing, were offended. What pain it must have brought to Him who loved them so well. So much better than you'll ever love anyone. You don't know what it is to be heartbroken as Jesus was heartbroken. Brothers and sisters, know that He ever lives to make intercession for us. That He is still praying and still yearning from heaven for the lost to come to Him. When you go in prayer to speak of Him to a, to a friend, when, you, when, when you're going to speak to a friend and you're praying before Him, He is yearning and praying with you at the right hand of the Father. Every time we gather for church, as I mentioned before, He is yearning and praying for the Word of God to work in all of us and in those among us that do not believe. Join Him in those prayers and in those yearnings. How can you be indifferent as a human being? See that you are faithful in your attendance, in your prayers for blessing, in your desire for God's Spirit to work among us. Don't bring Him grief by a cold, cool indifference to these things. I know that many in our church have health problems that keep you from attending regularly the services of our church. But let me urge all of you that when you cannot be here, to listen to the sermons at home because these sermons are the ones that God has given for our congregation. They are sermons that are prayed over for your sake. Just as Jesus, surely when He preached, prayed as He went from place to place. They're prayed over for your sake by our Lord, by me as a minister who delivers the Word. Sometimes I pray for each one of you regarding the sermons that are being delivered that week. And your elder and many of your fellow members pray for you regularly. I talked to a woman in our church this week that said she prays for every member of the congregation. So then you need not only attend, but also that you receive the Word in faith believing. Not just that you come, but also that you welcome the Word so that it benefits you and brings forth fruit and life in you. That Jesus might marvel at your belief, at how you respond to Him, at how you respond to the Word, rather at your unbelief that has things given to you and you walk away and are offended and do not take it in. How glad you will make Him as you come and welcome what He gives to you. Please stand and let's, let's ask Him now. Oh Lord our God, how we thank You for what You have appointed for us as Your people. Father, it's such, a, it, it, it's such an amazing thing that You have appointed that through the foolishness of preaching, that souls would be saved and that saints would be edified. And that when we welcome the Word of God, not as the Word of man, but as is in truth the Word of God that effectively works in those that believe, that it really does effectively work. It keeps us, it transforms us, and it converts us if we're not saved. We praise You, O Lord. And we pray that You would help us, Lord, as Your people that we would cry out for the blessing that, that you promised in connection with these things. Father, you've said it all through your word. You, you call us to come and eat. And we're so full of other things. Our unbelief, our pride, our blindness. Father, work in us by your spirit. Help us, as it says in the scripture, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves as a manner of some, but to encourage one another as we see the day drawing near. We would refresh each other. We would build each other up in the faith that we would welcome the truth that you have provided for us in your providence. Not that there's great preaching in one place or another, but that through the weakness of whatever is preached in your name, through the weakness of a cup of cold water given in your name, that you work. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you engage your prayers. 
that in fact, we're not really the ones who pray and you pray with us, but the other way around. You're the one who is praying for the church to be gathered, for your people to be kept and edified. You're the one who is praying for the means of grace that you have appointed. And we're the ones who join you in those prayers, praying in your name. And we praise you that because we come in your name, that the Father always hears us. We know, Lord, that that you will work your sovereign plan and that you will gather all those that you have appointed to salvation to salvation and you will cast all the rest into the lake of fire. Father, we pray, though, as we see these, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, people of our community, we would pray for them that you, O Lord, would do your work in them. We don't know what the outcome will be for each one of them. So we plead with you, O Lord, have mercy on them. We would desire to see our city come to the knowledge of the truth, that all of the officers, the the ministers of justice and the uh, leaders of our land and the all the community people, all the people that are are our neighbors and everyone here would come to know the truth and that you would remove the blindness and that they would see, Lord, it's such a clear thing and yet it's so fuzzy to proud unbelief. Father, we're all of that cloth and we thank you so much for what you have done in us. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you and we pray that we would cherish the new life that we have been given and the light that has entered our dark souls. Thank you, Lord. Send us forth in in your name, seeking your glory, that your kingdom would come, and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.